Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where our purpose is to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve your organization sustainably. Learn how to achieve and sustain an excellence journey for yourself, others, and the planet. And I'm your host, Brad Jevons, coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. We are proudly brought to you in association with SA Partners, a world-leading business transformation consultancy. SA Partners are a truly purposeful company focused on helping organisations achieve sustainable improvement for themselves, others and the planet. Welcome to episode 105 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. It is such a pleasure to have Mr. Rick Sather on the podcast with us today. Rick is the co-author of one of my favourite, most valued organisational improvement books, Lean RFS. Rick has previously been the VP of Customer Supply Chain at Kimberly Clark and is now helping many more organizations achieve excellence in operations and supply chain. Let's get into the episode. Rick, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Rick, mate, what's your backstory? Like I've read about it a fair bit myself through Lean RFS yep. and other research, but mate, do you mind talking about that backstory and what led you down this path of looking at supply chain excellence, you know, that whole supply chain? I think there's a couple key starting points for me uh, when I first got out of college and I was a scheduler um, at a plant that made facial tissue. The person that trained me brought me out and said, here's, we got to go out every day and put the new schedule out there. Um, and so we went out and I said, this doesn't seem right. Why are we doing that every day? And so I just got interested in why things work the way they do. And even in those early days in the back of my mind, I felt there had to be a better way. So I had always a passion for improvement. Making things better is what makes me tick. When I get to do that, I have fun and I've gotten to do a lot of it. So I get to have a lot of fun at what I do. Fast forward about 15 years, I was in a role working with the leader of manufacturing and I had responsibility for working with several of the plants. And he sent me out on a quest to say, look out there for some improvement uh, thoughts, improvement ways that we might be able to do at Kimberly Clark. And so this is when I bumped into Ian Glenday, who co-authored the book, Lean RFS, um, with me. And he had basically come up with a way to look at how could you produce and schedule production in a process industry in a way that's um, more predictable, more reliable. And that led a start of a journey that went on for many years, where we took those concepts and applied them first with Ian's help, and then he taught us and we moved on. And then also with help from others who taught us lean and continuous improvement concepts. So I had the great opportunity to do it as a, someone in a line leadership role, working in operations and supply chain for many years uh, in Kimberly Clark, and then subsequently with other companies uh, and then helping others. Yeah, wow. Rick, with, how did you connect with Ian? Because Ian's based in the UK. You're based in America. Ian hadn't, had Ian written a book he had or not? I can't remember. But how did you cross paths? Because that's pretty serendipitous, that one. It was one of those fortunate things that came about where I was searching for uh, speakers at conferences or different forums that you could go to and his forum came up and what's most interesting about it the first one that he had scheduled he got uh, couldn't travel for some reason so it got canceled and then the second one um, I was able to go to um, and I'll never forget that day because it seems like yesterday to me where I was like there's definitely something here that will work for us so it was it was almost a moonshot if you think yeah. about it that way in terms of what he did and maybe my mission to find some some things that could help us improve yeah you look at it it's like the perfect a great formula to get the outcome it did wasn't it like you've got yourself you got in some of his, his baseline theories he was putting together and then you were in a company of kimberly clark that is actually from everything i've experienced with kimberly clark plans it's there's this culture of trust. There's this culture of give it a go. Let's innovate, you know? And um, yeah. I think that's a, a really good formula that you had. Yeah. 
and, and an openness to you know recognizing we weren't as good as we thought we were yeah and how do we get that visibility to, to problems in a way that helps us get better so we had subsequent learning from uh, other leaders in the lean community who helped us as well yeah now rick i understand with with kimberly clark too you were working there and it you're talking massive machines really slow changeovers and like do you mind just describing the environment that you were you were dealing with on when you were really learning this craft and building your approach yeah absolutely so i'll, I'll just use one of the uh, product areas that kimberly clark has so tissue products so facial tissue toilet paper uh, paper towels um the base tissue is made on a very large machine that you know takes fiber and water and chemicals and um makes a enormous um, large roll of tissue that then is in essence disassembled on another machine that turns it into a roll of toilet paper and the assets themselves the base machines are in today's world probably 100 million plus dollar asset and then the the assets that convert it into the finished product are probably at least $10 million. So the mindset of when you invest that much money, we need to run it a lot to get the equity out of that. Right. So to get the value out of it, um, you know, those machines would run 300, 360, 362 days a year, 24, seven hours a day. Um, and that mindset was very much there. So yes, the idea of very traditional long runs are always better uh, in an environment of a consumer products company where more and more SKUs get developed because we want to have more options for consumers, more options for different retailers. And uh, so the SKU uh, portfolio had increased dramatically over the years at Kimberly Clark. And those ingredients made it very, a very compelling connection to Ian's concepts. Yeah. Yeah. It was, what was, because we'd described the factory there, you got this massive, big machinery factory, high investment, um, wants to run big batches, difficult changeovers. What was the dy dynamic like throughout the supply chain then out to the customer? What was the relationship like with sales and marketing and also with customers, because you mentioned one thing there that there was a high level of skew variability coming through because we, we want to experiment. We're wanting to do different things. Were there any other elements you could describe or what you were facing with that broader supply chain out to customers and with the sales and marketing team? I think it was the, com the explosion of complexity because different, cus different types of channels of customers require different things. So if you're in a, uh, a warehouse club environment, I need a large pack, right, of many units in it. If I'm in a convenience store, I might sell a one pack and then everything in between. And I want to differentiate between how I sell to this customer versus this customer so that I'll say the pricing dynamics aren't so like everything's vanilla. Yeah. And so that just added a lot of complexity. And uh, so it's the how much then with a desire to have long batches, how much finished goods inventory do I have to cover that variability that starts showing up in that supply chain? So that, I mean, from the day I started, I was there almost 30 years at Kimberly Clark. The complexity was a lot lower, but the, the issues were still there. Yeah. They just grew over yeah. that time frame. We're just going through that in Australia over the last 10 years with Costco coming in and other companies like that. Yeah. Where and a lot of companies are just handling those big packs at the minute manually. So it's just a real nightmare for them right now. Yeah. Rick, with, with the warehouses then, the, the storage in the middle, what were they experiencing as you through this time? Was the warehouse getting overburdened? Was it in flow? Absolutely. So the warehousing expense relative to the revenue for some of these products, it's a high volume, I'll say low revenue per cubic foot in a trailer or warehouse space. So 
this dynamic of how much inventory you have, not just the value of it, but the size that it takes. Um, Kimberly Clark had a, had a big network, still has a big network of warehousing. Probably the best example I can give you is a specific product that we ran in, and we, because of the capability of the uh, machines to make this product, it was a, a different size version of a facial tissue, so a little shorter. So we made it at one plant in Canada for the entire U.S. And it was not a very fun product to run. We did it in campaign run. So once every eight weeks, we'd force the plant to run it. And we'd fill up this warehouse and then ship it to the U.S. every day, every week. And then we'd run it again eight weeks later. That plant wasn't very good. It was a really good plant, but they weren't good at running this product. So every time you changed over, it was long. The ramp up after the changeover was slow. And then after you made this product, going back to the other products was very painful as well. So um, that was an example where you think about that warehouse. So we did this workshop there. We said, we're, we're going to break this pattern. We're going to do a faster cycle of production. And we're going to make this product every week. In essence, it virtually eliminated that one warehouse where that inventory had to reside because now we're making it every week so we can ship it every week. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm guessing in the previous world, the current state that was there, you had a warehouse that was overburdened and everyone was like, Oh my goodness. And yeah. then underburden, which is right. Heavy, heavy, and, heavy. and in that, yeah. And in that design, right. If you design to operate that way with large batches with a lot of items, where do you put the inventory? So you may have by where you make it a location that's got that bulk of inventory and then more customer facing locations, distribution centers that have uh, maybe more of what closer to what they need, right? So you've got to manage those combination of inventories in that environment a lot more. Mm. So massive complexity, like what we're describing is an environment where you've got the customer sales and marketing where it's all about high variety and a lot of change in new SKUs. You've got warehousing where the cost is growing, warehouses all over the place. They're either overburdened or maybe underburdened, but I'm guessing from what I've experienced, you typically remember the overburden where we're putting stuff in the aisles, just trying to make it fit. And then you've got a factory, yeah. which is large investment, high cost machines, running big batches, just trying to keep it running. And there's complexity and change over complexity and ramp up with certain products. Does that describe it well? Is there anything I've missed, Rick, with that, that you'd say to paint the current state picture? But yeah, or you do things to ad address those issues. So let's say your 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 inventory is building. Well, as you grow, let's say the company grows and that complexity is there, I might have to find another warehouse and find another warehouse and find another warehouse. So maybe I'm not overburdened. Um, and I've been in gridlocked warehouses and distribution centers before, so I know what it's like personally. And I've been in a lot lately where uh, they just have more material and goods than they can yeah. operate. Yeah. Uh, and they, and then the rain to... comes and then the rain comes and it's like, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And it just, then you start asking, what can I do about it? And what happens is the dynamics of how companies operate with sales and marketing and that design. So uh, often what I see today is that, there's not enough energy spent for people thinking about how do I want to design to run my supply chain? Yeah, this is and then, right. And then how do I get from where I'm at to how I want to run it? Yeah. Too um, true. And yeah. Rick, that's what I love. Most in part, your... people don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I loved in your book, Rick with Ian, because it was like such a shining light to me early in my career. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. Supply chain disruption and chaos, it is such a common thing today. Creating a future which is calm, where processes flow and continuous improvement occurs every day through engaged, motivated team members is an ongoing journey. Employee morale, unfortunately, is on the decline with turnover on the increase. Turning this around is a big effort, but it can be done and often requires support. The Enterprise Excellence Community has been designed to provide people leading excellence journeys with an organization support each month from one of our global experts for an hour who will call in via a Zoom meeting and then also via peers within common industries where we can collaborate in small teams and get help from each other for the second hour of the community meeting. 
The community is taking on new members. Um, if you're interested, please reach out. You can go to the enterpriseexcellenceacademy.com backslash contact to apply. It's for people practicing or involved in really playing a big part in these journeys and it's all about helping each other create that better future. But mate, if you look at it, if we throw what's happening now in supply chain. So I see and I understand that a lot of supply chains are still suffering what you just described at Kimberly Clark. Like that's still a given. But now on top of that, they have the pandemic. They have stock shortages. They have transport companies that can't ship because they've got employees with COVID or they can't hire yeah. enough employees. Like, let's just extrapolate this complexity. So it's a time that we need to do something differently or, or else, I guess, everyone's just going to keep burning out and keep either retiring early or moving on. Like, there's this massive plethora of what's going on right now, isn't there? Yeah. Like, what... what can organizations do to break this rig? Like what would you say are some of the key elements that organizations can look at and you help organizations with to get out of this cycle that's only getting worse mm -hmm. right now? Where can you find ways to build some level of stability in your supply chain or your operations or your business that can help minimize the impact of the broad supply chain issues? So, there's no doubt that everyone I've talked to in every industry, the lead times for materials are all higher. The reliability of that's lower. And in turn, they've increased their lead times to customers in some place. So lead times have just exploded. You know, I've worked with plants who used to have, uh, they were a make to order type process. They would have an eight-week lead time. Now it's 24 or 36 weeks. It's just, uh, and, and what's the reality is, is everyone's accepting that's just the kind of the new norm. So how do we break that? So the, the concepts that Ian laid out and we talked about in the book are, there are certain things that are universally true with, with people, uh, company sales. A few items are going to drive most of your sales. So if you can take those items and build stability, then lead time becomes less important. So uh, let's say my number one item, I can make every week and I buffer the variability of demand on it with some inventory. Um, so let's say I make that same amount every week. So if my lead time is one week or 10 weeks, and I know I need 100 units a week to make that item, it doesn't matter. Please deliver me 100 units a week every week. So it's a way to build stability so that for the supply side, as that gets disrupted, um, hopefully you can manage that. And then on the customer side, if I'm predictable and stable, I can be more reliable with them. What becomes hard is that first time that material doesn't arrive for that the number one item and I can't make it that week, typical MRP logic drives you to replan. And so it can unravel. So the, the discipline to do this is very difficult. I recently worked with a company whose demand increased dramatically um, during the pandemic. And they couldn't meet some demand and they had the same issues on supply. So we applied the concepts um, and then one of their plants for sure, increased their output by running the same sequence of SKUs every week, exactly the same. So I believe the output increase was at least 10%. Um, and they were able to set up a, a goal per week that they hit very quickly. So, not all workshops work like that, but I use it as an example to say, if you can put predictability in your supply chain at some level, you won't be able to do it for everything. Then you can, I think, reduce some of those issues in the supply chain. Wow. Okay. So the number one step out of the gate you're saying is to look at your high volume items, which I understand you and Ian call your runners. Is that correct? Yeah, Is that still the language. In language, he he calls it the green stream. The green stream. Uh, the, the green stream. Yeah, those 
green skews, but yeah, those are often called the rotters. Okay. The ones that are very high volume, typically predictable demand. Okay. So you look at that predictable demand and then you create a set frequency of production for those and try to create more frequency. You're doing the smaller batches more often. I guess yeah. to that, that conversation really shows that the answer to the initial answer you're saying to supply chain issues is come back up to the way that we plan and schedule and run production for those items or how we order from other vendors into our supply chain. I guess the same concept could be applied to a company buying inventory in from another country. You can look at the runners and buy in smaller batches more frequently. Yeah, I think it's a, there's some uh, production math around what's the shipment that, you know, quantity look like. So if it's a whole container, how does that relate to my demand if I'm big enough to have that? And so there are some, I'll call it those math a- aspects to look at. So it might be if I'm using uh, a container load every month, I would like one container every month. Um, now, when the the import process is disrupted and my 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 van is held up on the water, this is when things start falling apart. Yeah. So uh, this is where now the strategies of do I, even though I may not need this inventory because I run it every week, and if I could get it every week, I don't need very much. Um, that's where some of the strategies on how do I hedge that. And then that creates more uh, both effect because then everyone's doing it. And now yeah. we are where we are completely out of control. And so I guess with that, that comes back to those buffers that you spoke about. You need to be controlling and setting the right buffers or I guess, increasing your frequency more. If you do have some sort of flow in your supply chain, the thing I've loved about that Rick that I've seen, especially in the supply chain is that your supply chain becomes your warehouse. So rather than actually everything rapidly bulking up your warehouse and your warehouse just being overflowing and costing you on a supply chain company, the inbound supply chain of more frequency, the trucks and ships become your supply chain, your warehouse. And that's right. typically you're not paying, well, you're, you're paying for that space, but you're paying the same for that space. If like you said, you've got enough volume that you're covering the container, the 40, what is it? 40 foot container type piece. Like it's exactly. an interesting strategy. Yeah. And that's where, when you think about the design, this is where things from a broad supply chain point of view don't always work together because if I'm in manufacturing and scheduling and I'm thinking about how I schedule the plant, how is that connected to the people who do the material procurement and their understanding of how to do that? So if I'm thinking, I'm just going to try to get the best price I can, well, this supplier will give me a better price if I order more. And that's out of sequence with how I produce. That's where these issues come up. Or on the other end, how does the customer order? And are we connecting those dots together? So uh, functional compartmentalization is still an issue, right? So how do you bring the right groups of people together to think about the design more broadly, more end to end versus how do I optimize my portion? Yeah, that value, that extended supply chain or value stream thinking across it. What have you found works there, Rick? So it sounds like really the key second topic is how do you get that total system view going and collaboration? What have you found really works there? Is there an example from a company you've worked with or or Kimberly Clark that really started to create results there? Almost without exception, the best outcomes are when you bring the different groups together at once. So, you know, Ian's approach and the one we deployed for implementing RFS was rapid improvement workshops where we'd bring people from different functions across the company together. And so if you have someone from procurement participating in the design of how you're doing your production schedule, they can, they're part of that and they can automatically make the connection to how does it affect how I procure and inventory manage materials. If I have someone from sales and marketing involved, it can help make the connection to how do we go to market with products? How do we connect with customers? So whether it's a 
supply chain design question like that or a problem solving on a quality specific issue that I'm having and it's impacting a customer. Um, I recently had one where, you know, the, the, the salesperson who was dealing with us with the customers was involved with the team addressing a specific quality type question problem. Engagement matters. So it's just very difficult for that to play out every day. And so it's someone, whether it's an outside force or someone internally thinking about how do we connect the right people? And secondly, think about, are we operating the way we want to, or are we running our business just the way it is happening? And yeah. so it's that someone's got to ask that question. So it really sounds like you need that personal people that are running major improvement or improvement, continuous improvement where we're bringing the different parties together. And then also, like you said, when there's a quality issue, we're doing root cause together and then improving from there. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies I see to get that coordination, they run sales and operations planning meetings or integrated mm -hmm. business planning, or there's a number yep. of different names for it. How have you found those types of systems and what have you found works or doesn't work to get that cross-functional coordination and collaboration across the supply chain going? I would absolutely say without some process like that, a company's going to have difficulties. Uh, it just would, it, it's a required way to bring, if you go really simple, because integrated business planning can take it very broad. And I've seen a couple examples where that's been done well. But at the basic level, it's about, are we aligned on what we believe we're going to sell? And what's our production and inventory plan to support those sales? And when things happen differently than we thought, what decisions do we make? Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have all those groups together in the room, that's when your service to your customers falters because we thought we were going to sell X, we sold Y, we didn't talk about it. We made this product and the customer needs another product. Um, for new product launches, being aligned on how we're going to manage that because it's usually uh, my experience with product innovation isn't, it's just like something else we're doing and it, it can drop in the operation with no issue. Um, so being prepared for that, if I have uh, equipment modifications to make or a startup curve associated with a new product coming in, are we aligned on all that playing out? So absolutely a critical process. Uh, I've been involved in implementation and improvement of it several times myself. And uh, yes, good companies definitely have that in place. Uh, someone once told me in an early learning of these processes, do you have all the liars in the room? <laughs> and it's kind of a funny statement that stuck with me about no one's really a liar, but if I'm not there, you know, I don't have all the information I need. Yeah. And uh, so you got to have cross function. It can't be just a couple. It's got to be sales, marketing, operations, finance, supply chain. You need the full complement of the organization involved. Yeah, I, I can understand, you know, like, you know, sales and marketing, they know the potential, potential variance that's happening coming up. And then, of course, operations and the supply chain people need to know their capacities and what's going on in their world to plan it through. And then finance, the financials are really key across it. So it's all connected at the yeah. hip. Rick, what I find in a number of companies I've come across is when they're looking at that, you know, that sales to production or that sales to how many units do we require, some companies are looking at every unit they make in one big bucket. Others are doing it by category, but within that category, there's high volume items and mid tier volume items and small items. So they're applying a one stroke brush across the way that they look at their sales to production. They're not actually applying your original topic that you spoke about that there's one way you probably need to handle your high volume, your runners. Right. And then there's another way you may need to handle your mid tiers, your repeaters. And there's another way you may need to handle the tail, the strangers. Yes. Have you found that also? And if you have, what have you done to help give companies the insight 
that there's a different way, a more effective yeah. way. Most the most impactful way to do it is with an implementation of a change where you say, let's understand your whole portfolio. Um, we had plants that ran every product every week, but it wasn't really every product every week. It was every runner every week, probably the second tier every week, or maybe every second week with um, a mechanism in place that you have, uh, Ian used the phrase piggyback, an item that's very similar to another that, that you can run right next to it and it doesn't really impact the operation that you might run every week or you might run it every two weeks. And then for these red skewed strangers, the tail, uh, definitely a different strategy. So it might be examples where depending on the size of a company, a whole plant that is focused on running those type of items in a more disruptive environment and a more capable assets. Or you might take part of your schedule and say, schedulers, this is the zone of time each week or each every other week that you can schedule these slower moving, high volatility items in. And then your buffer tanks are probably bigger. Because the volume's a lot smaller, the actual value or amount of inventory may not be as high, but the days or weeks supply of that item might be quite high, relatively speaking. The, the, if I disrupt a high moving item, my number one SKU by one of my slowest moving SKUs in a highly designed environment with this structure in place, that should never happen. No. The fallout is so big. And I've seen it happen. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I've seen it happen. I've also yeah. seen greatness where companies have done this process and they've looked at their strangers and spoken to customers and actually figured out that we don't have to hold the strangers. The customers right. are happy to – actually, it's better for the customer because it's a short-life product to them to buy it and it be made just in time. You know, And that was a major outcome for one company I worked with because – those strangers were causing them grief, especially in short life Absolutely. product, but it was causing the customer grief. So by collaborating with the customer and the different supply chain people in this company, like you said, the cross-functional team, they went, hey, if, we, if the customer is the scheduler and they place just in time with the safety buffer they need, mm -hmm. we're going to get you stock that's got an extra two months life on it. Wow, that's great. Let's do that. Boom. Improvement yeah. done. So thank yeah. you, Rick. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. But it's it's um it's interesting, mate, when you talk about that, that you know, the way that you think about these things, like using that high volume, mid volume, and low volume. What I did for one company is draw it out and show the flat demand, and we looked at the data and flat demand, mm -hmm. and then the more spiky demand in the mid tier, and then the high spikes. When you look at that. Right. It's just logical that we got to treat them differently because your buffers have got to be different if you don't want to run out of stock. But if you're trying to apply the one buffer sequence across the whole thing, you're going to have a truckload more high volume. You're not going yeah. to have enough strangers and your mid tier is going to be going in and out all over the place. Yeah. I, and I think that last comment is key. It's how well do I understand my, my business and the behavior of my products. Yeah. And then how do I design? You can start with how I produce it, but then you can also think about how do I work with my customers and how do I work with suppliers? You know, it's from a company point of view, when a, when a customer says, I have an idea that we'd like to discuss, it's very, you want to have that discussion. Yeah, let's, we can look at that. We can do that. Oftentimes is done in most companies without a filter at all to should we. And so there is a element of how do you start to bring in the design up front of, you know, if this is a one-off, very unique, small volume item, does it really fit how we should do things? It's really hard though to say no, right, to those ideas from a customer. So it's this whole training and teaching and steering. This gets very challenging as time goes on because it, I've been in small work with startups. Um, I'm involved with small companies now. And in that environment, everything that's new is we should try that. Yeah. 
right? As you get bigger and you have a very complex portfolio of SKUs, then it's, uh, you have to think about it a little bit differently. What a great episode. Remember, you can visit our website, enterpriseexcellenceacademy.com backslash contact to reach out and apply for the Enterprise Excellence community if you are part of an excellence journey within your organization and are keen to gain support from our global experts and your peers in relevant organizations each month for a few hours via Zoom. It's a very short, sharp approach. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast to help each other gain insights and create a better future. We'll call an end to this episode with Rick and join him again next week for part two of the episode where we explore excellence and supply chain further. Bye for now.